We walk unconsciously towards catastrophes, but living from day to day, nobody reflects on this problem of time from which we all suffer. All those who are kept going by the here and now, forever now, fail to see where this is leading them. At least a suicidal person knows that he wants to commit suicide, whereas this race is unconsciously suicidal. The speed is caused by the uncontrolled development of science, technology, and the economy, which itself shifts us into a condition of widespread acceleration. What have we done to the notion of time? Forever faster, more efficient, more profitable. Time itself seems unable to escape the common measure of money. And we have entered the era of globalized acceleration, where immediacy has become the norm. But at what cost? And where does this stop? People have lost their bearings and are floundering in their lust for growth. And, predictable as it may be, we are hurtling on a collision course towards economic, social and ecological catastrophe. But the resistance is gathering force. All over the world, men and women have decided to escape the tyranny of urgency on our planet of limited resources. Who are these new rebels living against the tide, these forerunners who are today rediscovering a patient, fertile relationship with time? The tunnel should come out here, just below. Over there is the Amben mountain range. Behind is France, Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne, from where the tunnel should start to link Italy and France. This is a project which should cost 26 billion euros. That is the present figure, because we don't know how much it will cost in the end, once it's finished, if the project goes ahead. If you look at the motorway, there isn't much traffic. If you look at the existing railway, there's even less traffic. So why spend so much money on a project which all the figures, in addition to what we see here, show to be unnecessary? We think that with 26 billion euros, we could create a lot more jobs in the region. No Tav is a movement that opposes the high-speed Turin-Lyon railway line. It began 20 years ago because in this valley the usefulness of the project was contested from the outset. The TGV high-speed train is the fruit of a development model that is no longer suitable for our world. We're already hurtling at high speed towards an abyss, and this development model urges us to accelerate faster towards that abyss. It impels us to accelerate when we're actually falling. If anything should accelerate, its ideas are not people or goods. Modernity is not about going forward faster, but going forward with greater wisdom. What's happening here is a time war. In modern society, we no longer take the time to reflect and look around us or adopt a rhythm of life commensurate with mankind. Modern society requires computers to be working round the clock, and they alone decide what we invest in. The financial world always needs to accelerate, because if it stops, everything could collapse like a house of cards.
We think it's about financial interests. It's in the interest of banks to lend money to states that run up debts to complete major projects. It seems to us that the driving force behind projects of this scale is the possibility of concentrating enormous sums of public money, the citizens' money, in very few hands. These projects that are justified solely by financial speculation. Siete delle truppe di invasione? Avete l'ordine di non parlare con i cittadini, quelli che vi pagano lo stipendio? Non vi vergognate? Si sono impossessati di questo terreno e l'hanno occupato militarmente. Quando la politica non è più stata in grado di confrontarsi con i cittadini, ha adottato questo modo. È un modo violento. What we're living through is truly the colonization of our time, whether it be biological, social, or ecological, by economic time. That seems to be the fundamental point for me, the absorption by economic time, which is a time that is empty, rootless, without society or history, and which is solely occupied with the circulation of capital, the faster circulation of information, information replacing knowledge, where everything has to circulate. Dans une économie capitaliste, le temps c'est l'argent et aussi la logique de compétition est un élément, un moteur euh, essentiel pour la logique d'accélération. Tatsächlich ist es so, dass, dass also obwohl die, moderne, die Geschichte der Moderne eine ist der permanenten Einsparung von Zeitressourcen, ist sie gleichzeitig eine Geschichte der immer knapperen Zeit, des immer zunehmenden Zeitdrucks. Und das führt schon dazu, dass wir uns unter Stress fühlen, obwohl wir technisch schneller geworden sind. Techniquement, on est devenu plus rapide, mais on a plus de stress. On, on ne peut pas, man kann Zeit nicht vermehren. On peut pas augmenter la quantité du temps comme ça. Also woran liegt es dann, dass wir sozusagen das Gefühl haben, wir, wir sind gefangen in einem Hamsterrad? If people don't have any more time in which to work or to consume, if, you know, if we're just so tired now, that the only way we can increase the surface area of our consumption and production is to, you know, put devices on ourselves that keep us, you know, we're working, we're buying, we're consuming. You know, I'm not just talking to my friend, I'm tweeting to my friend. So there's a, the commercial engines can still be fed through every action. Um, you know, it gets ridiculous, we get depressed, we have to then take drugs, but that's good because if we're taking drugs and we're spending money on the pharmaceutical industry, on the doctors, keep the GNP growing. The first step to get out of this nightmare is to realize that we're dreaming. But it's also to understand that we've activated a machine, that modern society has become a machine that advances blindly in a direction contrary to modernity's promises of self-determination. It's possible to escape all of this. 
The fact of waking up and emerging from the dream will not suffice to change the system. We also need to revolutionize the very founding principles of modern societies, and this revolution will affect the economy. The question isn't, how long can we continue to accelerate, but how long do we want to continue accelerating? Here, two actors are responsible. I'm thinking in particular of the financial sector, I'm thinking of banks, but I'm also thinking of a whole sector of industry, of the philosophy of company shareholders today who demand instant profitability and as large a profit as possible. All this contributes substantially to accelerating time. In the United States, the accelerated financialization of the economy over the last two decades benefited first and foremost those who were quick to understand that one could make even more money by becoming masters of time using computers and their programs, which now exceed all human limitations. My name is Thomas Paterfi. I'm the founder of uh, Interactive Brokers. We cater to financially sophisticated individuals, introducing brokers, hedge funds, uh, proprietary traders, mutual funds, and financial advisors. But that, we have to go outside. It's OK, yes? yes. OK. This is my daily commute. This is where I uh, do my work uh, on the days when I don't go into the office and I don't have meetings. I didn't speak English when I came to America, so I had to find a job and not speaking English, that wasn't easy. So finally I realized that I could learn to program computers quicker than I could speak English, and so that's what I did. And this is my study. This was the original computer we used on the floors in 1983. This is equipped with a touch screen. It would be plugged into a power cell that was relatively large. It weighed about two pounds. It was worn on the, on the trader's belt. This was the first computer ever on the stock exchange. The other people were trying to guess what the proper prices for options would be, and my traders would uh, know exactly what they should be. So we had a, we had a strong advantage. I was nearly bankrupt when I went this machine was invested. <laughs> I heard that your company weighs like six billion dollars. Currently, it's about eight billion. Yeah, eight, eight. No, it's nine. It's nine billion. Capitalism is the natural state of man. It will never, it will never break down. You know, there's competition. We, you know, we are, we are evolutionary programmed to compete. You got to make sure that you are the one who has the better weapons. Whoever has the better software is the one that's likely to win in any competition. It's a social crisis speeded up by technology. Capitalism is completely uncoupled from the human agenda, right? It has nothing to do with human beings making conscious choices about humanity's future movements. Instead, it's about machine-based algorithms predicting the time travel strategies of other machine-based algorithms.
The New York Stock Exchange, which is officially in Wall Street, has made sure that this place is only fit for tourists taking photos, and the TV cameras that show a few remaining human traders who in fact only monitor the screens, watching the algorithms do all the work. The real New York Stock Exchange has actually relocated to New Jersey, and the market has become what is called a data center. That is a center for processing data. And what about the market? Roughly speaking, it's a server of about this size, a sort of computer that connects buyers and sellers who are now algorithms that buy or sell. And these algorithms, in order to go extremely fast compared to this central server, that is the market, are located right next to the server. This is called co-location. Thanks to co-location, the algorithms can send an order to execute to the New York Stock Exchange in 37 microseconds. That's, what, 1,350 times faster than the blink of the eye. In temporal terms, the human operators are no longer on an equal footing. And in the old days, even when I was growing up, the idea was you would invest in a company, say, you know, AT&T or IBM. You'd buy the stock in that company, you'd own a little piece, and you'd wait 20 years, 30 years for that to be worth more, because the company's going to grow over those decades. That's capitalism. Everything grows. Nowadays, people don't really have that patience, right? So instead of buying a stock now and selling it in 30 days or three months, I buy a future on that stock. So what's a future on that stock? It means now, instead of buying the stock today, I'm buying it now, three months from now. I'm betting on its price three months in the future today. So what people think about what's going to happen then can be traded on now. So what we've done is compressed all that three months of time into now, into this one trade. That's called a derivative. If I trade this second, what if somebody is going to trade like just the second before I've traded? Now they are three months in the future and I'm, you know, three months in the future but two seconds after they're three months in the future, which is all magnified because of all this compression. So what we're going to do is get really, really fast computers. And we're going to see when that person makes a trade, and then we're going to trade based on their trade before their trade goes through. Right? So now if I'm at Goldman Sachs and I've got the strongest computer with the best connection and ultra-fast algorithms, I can trade based on their trade before their trade happens. I'm literally trading in that trader's future. I'm trading futures in that trader's future. Right? But if I don't watch out, there's another guy with a better algorithm and a faster computer trading in my future. There's an obvious marketing side to the makers of algorithms, since you have to be more aggressive than your competitors to make money. There are so-called guerrilla algorithms. Guerrilla is a Credit Suisse algorithm. And then there's an algorithm like Sniper, which works for Goldman Sachs, biding its time, observing the other algorithms, and understanding their logic. Then in a flash, it'll act to make the most of a flaw in transactions or the quotation orders made by other algorithms. 70% of the transactions in the United States are now high frequency, while in Europe it's a little more than 50%. There are some things which are frankly mind-bending. For example, thanks to a system of fiber optic cables in 2014, it'll be possible for information to cross the Atlantic from New York to London. Each of these cables costs in the region of $300 million, all that to save five to six milliseconds. So these figures are very significant and revealing. And this technology makes any monitoring activity utterly derisory. Consider, for example, that the SEC, which is the policeman of the American Stock Exchange, the commission that oversees exchanges, takes something like three months to analyze what happens in three minutes. Under these conditions, inevitably, the logic of these processes increasingly eludes any form of control. This is another way to look at algos making up. Machines are always exact. They, they do uh, the same things over and over and over again, and they leave footprints. 
And so this is one way of us being able to see those footprints. Each one of those little points of light you see going from one to the other is a, a new order being placed by a high frequency trader. And there are no trades going on in a lot of these examples. So these are the prices that are being placed in there to see what other algos will react to that price. And the whole goal is to sniff out the real buyer, the institution, the guy, the money manager who's, who's managing your 401k or your pension. That's the guy they want to find. They're trying to get him, if it's a human, they're trying to get him to pay a little bit more than he would otherwise uh, if he's buying or to sell for less. They're not interested in emptying the bank overnight. They're just interested in shaving a penny off of every transaction. They've gotten very good at stealing just enough that you won't say anything and now uh, doing it fast enough that you won't notice. <laughs> Right, so what really what we're looking at is no longer has anything to do with supply and demand or the market or economics. We're not investing in companies in order to promote the appropriate distribution of capital for the future investment of humanity. What we're doing is playing a bizarre abstracted game of time travel in which the person who can compress the most time the fastest wins the game. All the money goes into the pockets of the people who already have the money. So they have a lot more money, but it doesn't help the average person. There are many people who have vested interest in maintaining the status quo. In 2008, the House of Cards of globalized finance well and truly collapsed after pushing its own speculative logic to the extreme. The global economic earthquake that followed left us on the edge of the abyss. But even that was not enough to calm people's appetite for more. The game is now in full swing once again at the casino table. The architects of the crisis, those who benefited from that risk-taking financial speculative behavior that made them enormously rich sometimes, were actually rewarded after the crisis by government subsidies, and those government subsidies were paid for by ordinary people, by the people actually who had suffered most from that crisis. Actually, most of the conditions for that collapse have continued or worsened since the crisis, so the level of sovereign debt actually is higher now than it was just before the crisis. The level of prices in general is higher now than it was before the crisis. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is higher now than it was before the crisis. And the number of resources that we have available to us is lower than it was before the crisis. So in other words, all of the factors that led to the crisis in 2008, 2009 are still present in the economy, still present in society. And um, what we've done is we've created a set of institutions that says greed is good. Selfishness is good. Go out and consume. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure is good. Self is good. The always more imperative is interiorized by those who are in competition. There's no other choice. And the famous slogan of Mrs. Thatcher, there is no alternative, is always repeated. So this is a change that dates back to the early 1980s, which we got into the habit of describing by resorting to the term neoliberalism. We're now living the aftermath of this. But the question we must ask is, how can we put an end to this system and the pernicious effects it produces once and for all? 
Economic growth, or more precisely the growth of GDP, is decelerating. Instead of adapting to this reality by reorganizing our cultural system, our cultural values and social relations, our relationship with technology and the environment, we are out of phase, in conflict, in contradiction between a culture that seeks to accelerate and the reality of the world, which is that of deceleration. Caught up in this contradiction without necessarily perceiving it, we continue to get nowhere fast. Though there are exceptions. A new world is emerging, though still invisible to those who pay it no heed. To discover it, one must leave behind the bland industrial zones on the outskirts of towns, like here in romont sur isere In the heart of this town, which is in constant decline, a new relationship to time and money is being invented, thanks to the creation of a local currency, an initiative of an association of ordinary citizens. Today, I use the mesure system of payment. There's a whole network of shopkeepers in romont sur isere that accepts the mesure. It might be a shoe shop or a delicatessen or whatever. We use this as much as possible to squeeze the banking system a little in our own small way. Having this currency in our hands obliges us to ask questions. And instead of going to the supermarket, I go to the small shops. For me, it's a gesture of activism, that's for sure. Because you can't spend it elsewhere. So this will help local farmers and artisans to survive. When they pay in mesure, they feel they're not really paying with money. They're keeping a certain distance away from the financial money point of view. That's how I see it. It's perfectly possible to mix mesure and euros because they're absolutely convertible. In fact, you have to know what kind of world you want to live in. An Amazon employee does the same work as 16 independent bookshops. Just remember that when you buy a book in an independent bookshop and when you pay in mesure, which furthermore is the local currency, it makes a lot of sense. With a local currency, you have to impose criteria. You're not going to buy just anything from anyone. You have to follow the rules, so not any old how and not anywhere, because it's a population catchment area. The economy has eliminated moral questions. But in a way, local currencies bring them back by saying, well, yes, this person providing a service is, to put it as simply as possible, a good guy. What we're going to eat is good. The way it's produced is good. The way it's sold is good. The way he treats his employees is good. And the way he treats his customers is good. And since it's all good, well, we encourage you to go to him. So the interest is that you're relocalizing the economy. There's an automatic effect, simply because the currency note can't be used or spent outside the population catchment area. As a first response, that's what it's for. It effectively relocalizes the economy. It puts the economy back in its rightful place. It's a smaller place and not the first place, but just the fact that we need units of account to allow exchanges. It's like a do-it-yourself approach to the economy, taking things into our own hands. Just in little ways, it's true, but it's a case of small is beautiful. We're taking things in hand from below and deciding what to do. You shouldn't say, yeah, well, I don't know anything about the economy. Apparently, they're screwing us over. No, that's not good. You have to see what's going on and act instead of being passive. Thanks.
Thanks for all the carbon you're saving. We can live without it. So very grateful are we. So we say thanks for riding your bike, for making Bristol green. Here is your medal. I'm George Ferguson, I'm the Mayor of Bristol. I'm paid in Bristol Pounds, it's a complimentary currency and um, I'm the richest person in Bristol Pounds. <laughs> and uh, Of course it's marginal in terms of the amount of money that's circulated in the city, but it's a way of challenging the, the, the big move to these global companies who are only interested in the huge profits for their shareholders. So yes, we're open to ideas. We're a test bed for a new way of doing things. I'm offering the city as a laboratory for new ideas. So what we make sure is that growth is beneficial rather than damaging. A relocalized economy is a more resilient economy. In other words, there's much better resistance to external shocks when you've got a solid local economy. On the other side of the Atlantic, Times Square is still the absolute symbol of a society of globalized overconsumption. But this is perhaps just a facade. In upstate New York, people have been experimenting with alternative approaches for over 30 years, the opposite of the logic of economic acceleration. In this alternative America, which is more human but still on the fringes of society, the relocalization of the economy is already underway, inspiring new practices that, since the crisis, are beginning to spread throughout the country because they have proved their worth here on a local scale. In Ithaca we trust, yes, cash money. Ithaca Hours has been here since 1991, so over 20 years. The idea of supporting local businesses is a very important issue, not just within the, the community's economy, but worldwide it is an issue. You're not going to try to fool your neighbors. You're not going to try to manipulate your neighbors for your own gain, because you're part of a community. I don't really know where change comes from. It can come from surprising places. When this food co-op started, it was just people who wanted to avail themselves of good food. We used to have uh, oats that we would keep in a garbage bin and we would take it out and there were no cashiers, people paid for it themselves. And now it's 30 years later and this business is one of the uh, 30 top businesses in Tompkins County in terms of employing people. It employs over 200 people. And what that is trying to do is make living in America human-sized again. Lorraine and Marcellic, your orders are ready in the deli. The food is fair trade, it's natural, it's organic, it's locally produced, it's healthy, it's fresh, and it's ethically produced. One thing we do is we put local products right at eye level on the shelf. Uh, other stores actually make companies pay for that. We give this to our local companies right off the bat. We give them better pricing when we buy from them, and we take lower margin on our local products to help promote and support our local producers. We have 29,000 plus people live in Ithaca, uh, and we have uh, 8,500 members, so almost a third of the people in town are members. We are trying to make our community a better place to live all around for all the members of our community. So not just for the businesses, not just for the farmers, but for the people.
that our board is elected, of course, and we also have a nonprofit wing, uh, Green Star Community Projects. We offer a 15% discount to anyone who has uh, uh, any kind of government assistance. So we, we work really hard to make sure that, w that everyone in our community has access to, to good, healthy food. How are you doing this evening? <laughs> good. Oh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Here you go, ma'am. I get the feeling that people are beginning to get fed up with the rat race. I think that people are realize that having time with family and time to pursue personal interests is extremely valuable. Breakfast. Oh, where's Kai? Where's Kai? I don't see him. So many to hug before it got dark. Dark. What animal did you hear? A froggy, that's right. Mm. Yeah. What's up, bud? What's up? Are you tired? Mm. Yeah. Where are the beets, Kai? Where? Show me. There they are. Do you like beets? Yum. Mm. Um. I, I definitely can't claim to have a no-impact life. <laughs> that would be both awesome and terrifying. Yeah. I'm a firm believer in the voluntary simplicity movement. It's not austerity, it's choosing your priorities and choosing what really matters. Um, we have one car, and I, we used to have not have a car at all. Um, get by on bike when we can, and, and walking and biking. Also supporting local economies where we live, where we work, keeping that money local. You know, one thing that kind of scares me a little bit about global economies is that what goes into what we consume is out of our control. You know, if we're buying products in China from, from China, they do not have the same health standards for their workers. They don't have the same environmental standards for their uh, production. Sweet, savory, and spicy eggplant dish. Many people in Ithaca have chosen a voluntary simplicity of lifestyle to take back control of their lives and escape from the tyranny of the ever faster, the ever more profitable. To achieve this, they simply decided that time was not necessarily synonymous with money. We forget that time is also a human construct. Other animals are not governed by time. And so um, when we equate time with money, we're really just equating two human constructs that, that aren't real. So if humans created the meaning behind time and the meaning behind money, we get to change what the meaning is if we want to. We get to decide what time means. We get to decide what money means. And we get to decide whether or not time and money are really equal. We were founded in 1979. Alternative started in a car with a cash box. We grew to a card table in the back of the food co-op. And when I started 30 years ago, we were in a very small, rickety office up a number of steps. Alternatives was founded to serve the underserved and to meet unmet needs in our community. At a credit union, you're a member, not a customer. Everyone who banks here owns the credit union. You're Money here is called shares. Those are your shares. We don't have stockholders like banks do. Traditionally, people of modest income just lose their money to fees. We don't charge fees on our transactional accounts. We have been a partner with Ithaca Hours since the start. And we collaborate with local farmers, with local builders. We do business loans for everybody from landlords to beauticians so that we see people who work with us sharing and growing and connecting. Good, how are you doing? The impact in our community is huge. 
We have impacted people's lives from teenagers through seniors who have uh, found themselves in tricky situations where nobody wants to deal with them and every, at every level in between. I'm seeing real change. I'm seeing businesses that are uh, stepping up in their own communities saying we are going to build a different future. So I see, uh, for instance, community foundations who uh, maybe traditionally had all the money of their foundation planted out in Wall Street and then the small bit that they get from those investments uh, they give in grants to their communities. Now waking up to say, wow, uh, we actually could use all of this money to be of benefit to our community. Communities. How do we use that money that's off in Wall Street to invest actually in the businesses in our own neighborhood? Today, people are connecting across communities. That's a lot of our role, for instance, is connecting these ideas between communities. One community comes up with something, another takes that idea and builds upon that. And soon you see whole regions that are they're living into being a different kind of future. La promesse. The promise of a future that is peaceful and serene is on the side of those who imagine the world differently, who say a different world is possible, when in the short term we should avoid an ecological catastrophe, mainly in the form of climate change. This is a dimension that capitalism and the present oligarchy are totally incapable of taking into account. They are out of ideas. This is perhaps the challenge of the century, to escape from a model of growth that continues to drain the limited resources of our planet, while the urgency of climate change becomes an increasingly undeniable reality. The decade 2001-2010 was the warmest on record, continuing the trend of global warming. The increase in greenhouse gases, unprecedented for CO2 over the last 800,000 years, lead to a warming. Human influence on the climate system is clear. So the IPCC report demonstrates that we must greatly reduce global emissions in order to avoid the worst effects of climate change. We have a huge responsibility for our children and grandchildren. So I hope this will inform the public, uh, decision makers, negotiators, and heads of government. What has not yet been understood is how terrifying this situation is. We're asleep. Every one degree, temperature rises, the atmosphere is sucking up more precipitation because of the heat. That means it's throwing off the whole water cycle of the Earth. And what you're seeing is these huge concentrations of precipitation and then massive extreme water events. So you're getting bitter extreme winter snows, more concentrated spring floods and longer prolonged summer droughts, volatile category three, four, and five hurricanes, and glacier melts. We could lose upwards of 50 to 75% of all the creatures, the species on this planet by as early as the end of this century. We're not dealing with the enormity of this. And our own species is now in jeopardy.
So the traditional response of capitalism is technology, always more technology. Let's speed up technology. Let's geoengineer. Let's do nuclear power. Let's do new energy sources in profusion, but without changing the fundamental system and without challenging social relations. We'll do geoengineering by seeding the oceans, for example, or deploying types of solar umbrellas to protect us from global warming, etc. So, in effect, we have to continue accelerating and even accelerate faster in a sort of mad headlong rush. This is not about being opposed to technology, but collectively reappropriating technology and not relying solely on technology. This means that we need to direct our economic system in a totally different way. Starting now, let's behave as if we had already run out of oil and reorganize our society as a world without oil. And let's take the time to make this transition. That's the kind of political reasoning that governments no longer adopt these days. Trapped by the dictates of immediacy and acceleration, politicians no longer seem capable of offering long-term visions. Today, one must look elsewhere, to citizen movements that operate away from the eyes of the media, to those who are resolutely preparing for what they call transition. In fact, the transition is about how to go from the model of society we have now to a model of society which, for us at any rate, should be profoundly ecological and profoundly respectful of human beings. So the transition is the movement from one to the other, and that's what we're living through now. New kinds of financial organizations are making the economy serve human well-being rather than the personal material enrichment of a minority. Companies, citizens, men and women, elected representatives are prioritizing a real, social, collective economy anchored in local regions and human communities. Today, we are creating a group devoted to citizen transition. Don't wait for change to happen. Let's take our future in hand now, everywhere on the planet. The Collective for Citizen Transition was launched modestly in a fairground marquee far from the media frenzy. Nevertheless, it already unites 12 companies, associations and social banks, which are all trying to put human beings back at the heart of the economic system. The problem is human beings. If human beings don't change, I often say to people that you can eat organic food, recycle water, heat your homes with solar energy, and still exploit your fellow beings. It's not incompatible. So beware of change that's simply structural change, not human change. If human beings don't change, nothing will change. There's one good thing about the crisis, and that is that at last, from our disenchantment and bankruptcy, for it's a genuine bankruptcy, our true values are now emerging. Pierre Abbey wanted to embody these true values through colibri, hummingbirds, a movement that is now spreading throughout a multitude of groups in every corner of the country which seeks to recreate social bonds and a dynamic of concrete change on the ground in town and country alike. We've understood at last that the economy goes in one direction today and does not benefit the majority. We're aware of pollution and all that, and today at our own level we do what we can. In my view, not adapting to a sick society is actually a sign of good health. It's about small efforts, yes, like looking after your garden, doing things yourself, mending stuff instead of throwing it away and buying again. It's not about going back to candlelight, but getting back to basics, returning to simplicity. What do we really need in life to be happy? The transition movement first began in Totnes in southern England eight years ago. 
we now know that in 2006, the year after we started here, was the year the world peaked in conventional oil. And we're now, uh, what's keeping us going is really unconventional oil. Uh, things like tar sands and gas fracking. And we're told that that represents a new golden age for fossil fuels. But it's really a retirement party for fossil fuels. And the longer that we are dependent uh, on it, then the more vulnerable we are. After working in organic agriculture, Rob Hopkins took up the pen and created Transition, a model of alternative approaches that is now present in 43 countries. It is the fruit of highly effective viral communication, principally on the web. There are limits. Limits to the amount of carbon dioxide our climate can handle, to the amount of energy available to us, and to the degree to which economic growth is still possible. Around the world, People are already seeing these limits as opportunities. They aren't waiting for permission. They're coming together to create stronger and happier communities, more resilient and vibrant economies, and taking a power back at the same time. It's the power of just doing stuff, and I think it's one of the big ideas of our time. You can start small but visible, and it can grow. In Kilburn, London, a local group have created the first edible garden on an underground station. In Fujino, Japan, they created their own electric company, which has since inspired another 40 communities across Japan to do the same thing. All of this can be done anywhere. You might look at and say, well, how is that community garden going to, going to save the planet? How is a few people planting trees going to, uh, going to reverse climate change? But actually what it does is it gives people a sense that they can make a difference. Maybe for the first time in their lives, the transition is about how we breathe possibility into a place. So when we encounter disaster, we don't go, oh, what can we do? But we go, right, okay, we can do this, we can do that, we can do local food, and you know, this is a social experiment. This is open source. And so transition in Italy is an Italian thing. Transition in Canada is a Canadian thing. It may look a little bit different, but it is recognizably transition in all those places. Transition has as many facets as it has active groups throughout the world. Each has its priorities depending on local circumstances. In Brooklyn, for example, in the heart of urban New York and less than three kilometers from Wall Street, people are trying to make it easier to eat organic food by inventing ways of making it accessible to one and all. Uh, next, we're sending down sweet onions. This is some of the freshest produce in all of New York. What do I do when I don't work here? I'm a self-employed accountant. I'm a caterer. I'm a chef, yeah. I'm a musician, yeah. Interior designer and furniture designer. I'm a photographer in real life, in my everyday real life. <laughs> this is not real life here, right? <laughs> Every four weeks, members need to do a shift, and, and it's two hours and 45 minutes. If you miss a shift, you owe, by default, you will owe two. This is the membership office, and we have about 16,000 members, and they could walk in here, or they could call about changing their work shift. It's a tremendous task, coordinating uh, all those thousands and thousands of people to work mostly every four weeks. I'm joining the food co-op. <laughs> I'm really excited. Look this way, smile. smile. All right, okay, there we go, go. nice smile. I know I have to so dedicate have a, some time doing something productive, right, for other people, for the community, for the environment. Um, it feels really good, better than just sitting on my ass and watching TV all day, right? Over the last 10 years, membership has really increased. People are completely fed up with the economic crisis we've been going through. I think that people are interested in price, but I think that there's just a malaise in the society we live in right now. It goes so beyond food, you know, um, being green and taking care of the environment. I actually look forward to doing my work shift because 
I have a good time. In my work life, I work on my own, and I work with clients that come to see me. And when I work here at the food co-op, I'm part of the team, and there's the interplay and the working together that I find really satisfying. Well, we have very little prepackaged food. Even cheese is cut here and wrapped here. So by saving the labor costs, we uh, everything is passed along in savings to the members. I get gorgeous, amazing, fresh, organic food for amazing prices for working here for a few hours every month. And I enjoy working here. It's a nice way of building community. I'd say it's not about giving my time as much as uh, just part of being something that uh, works through capitalism in a different way. And when I empty my groceries into my car or to my house, uh, they'll take the cart back to the co-op for me. The transition has begun. We're already fully into this major ecological and social transition. People are realizing things. There are many more people than we think who want to change the paradigm and change the system. This is something that's spreading silently through society and becoming palpable, though it's not causing a major commotion. We produced a topsy-turvy system. Modern agriculture is about making nature artificial and replacing it with oil, fossil fuels, chemical substances, pesticides, genetically modified organisms, and so on. This is a gigantic move backwards. Modern agriculture is based on a fertility surplus, which comes from the Carboniferous period, several hundreds of millions of years ago. But we'll have blown it all just like that in a century. Yep, yep. It takes 10 to 12 calories of oil to make a single food calorie. That can't go on. Permaculture is a conceptual system inspired by nature. We've really set up an agro-ecosystem that's natural, that works without chemical substances, without fossil energy, and without watering. There's a sort of fecundity that comes from nature, which, in our modern Western imagination, we no longer perceive. We've completely obscured it because we're too cut off from nature. But in fact, nature is super fertile, which is to say that this garden is completely autonomous. We look for dead leaves, ferns, nettles, self-propagating plants, like, for example, the comfrey, which has roots that go down several meters. So it's a real mineral pump. This creates a source of mulching which is available on the spot, for free, and that's how I fertilize. And it's a system that's as old as the world, and which has supported civilizations with high-density populations in the past. For example, it was practiced in China 4,000 years ago, by the Greeks 2,000 years ago, by the Mayas and the Incas. So we have a system that's both completely autonomous and very productive. What's more, it's beautiful. In a way, we're trying to recreate the Garden of Eden, and it turns out that it's very productive. And the second nice present that life has offered us is that the produce also tastes a lot better. Since we export alternative market gardening practices, a year and a half ago we launched a study with an INRA unit and Agro Peritech. And the hypothesis that we're trying to validate is that 1,000 square meters of organic permacultural market garden can create a reasonably well-paid job. At a time when people want to lay workers off at all costs, have as small a workforce as possible, mechanize as much as possible and use machines instead of human beings, we're going in completely the opposite direction. Rather than provide CAP aid to cereal farmers for hectares and hectares of fields, we help smallholder farmers with small areas of land to recreate systems like that. It's environmentally sustainable, friendly, and it creates jobs. We've created a real business here. What makes this a beautiful adventure is that suddenly there are lots of people trying to invent tomorrow's world in all sectors, everywhere. We receive a lot of visitors from North America, South America, Japan and Africa. 
That goes from a simple farmer or a Cuban permaculture teacher who has just spent several days here to a Brazilian minister or NGO managers. It inspires a lot of people. I see it like seeds in a vegetable garden. You sow them, and at some point they sprout. With some people, it will take longer to understand and for the ideas to grow and be put into practice in daily life. If you don't start by thinking that it's possible, you'll never succeed. This goes way beyond gardens. It can be applied in town and potentially in all spheres of human activity. It's up to us to awaken our creativity and our imaginations. One can conceive of permaculture companies which are not predators on their environment, but which give more than they take, and as a result flourish even in a world of crisis, even in a world in profound transition. We often tend to look mockingly at a certain number of alternative practices because we think they're nostalgic for the past, whereas very often this is absolutely not the case. It's really quite different. What's being dreamt up are forms of life in which the relationship to time is very different from the prevailing one. Lastly, I believe that the outcome will be that these local experiences can link up with each other and communicate what is best to communicate or learn. Then we shall certainly see movements take form on a global scale from the coordination of local experiences. That, anyway, is what's to be desired, because it seems to me that this is the only alternative we can design today. Ten years ago, anywhere in Colorado, you probably wouldn't see a solar electric system. Now, if you drive in any neighborhood, you're likely to see one, if not multiple. I would love it if more people, more businesses, more communities had their own means of generating their own electricity instead of always having to depend on a centralized utility company to purchase your electricity. It's a big house. <laughs> but if the home doesn't need that electricity, because everybody's away at work and school and there aren't very many appliances that are on, and it'll spin the, the customer's meter backwards to give them credit, retail credit, for that electricity that they produce, and then instead their neighbors will use that solar electricity. And here in Colorado, we get more than 60 to 70% of our electricity from burning coal, and that is nasty stuff. We want to displace as much coal as we can. Once a month, this is where we exercise our democracy. Uh, this is like our parliament in here, when we're all members of the parliament. We all sit in a circle around this room, you know, and there's, there's 50 of us. We go through co company financials. Uh, we go through how much solar we're installing. Uh, we go through human resource issues. It's one person, one vote. I think we want to make money, but that's not the only thing we want to do. We think that businesses ought to exist to maximize benefits for all stakeholders, not just stockholders. And by stakeholders, we mean employees, customers, investors, the environment, the community, vendors, other partners that companies should be looking at for all of them. And there are already several million people in producer and consumer cooperatives that are harvesting energy at near zero marginal cost once they get the technologies in. The sun, the wind, it's all free. Yet we're in fossil fuels, which are increasingly expensive, polluting the planet, leading to climate change, undermining our ability to be productive when we have all this possibility. So all I can say is either we're the dumbest species on the planet with all our intelligence, or we simply have not stepped back, become reflective and mindful and say, here's all the opportunity. The example may also be set in the South. 
like here in Rajasthan, in an India that is in the throes of an economic boom, but where the growth model imported from the West is far from commanding consensus in a country of more than a billion inhabitants. Growth for whom and growth at whose expense? There are millions and millions of people who don't have housing, who don't have schooling, who don't have safe drinking water. The growth should be for them. The focus, unfortunately, is on making the poor more dependent on the rich and on the urban areas, and this is unacceptable today. Here, this campus is fully solarized. We have more than 80 kilowatt power from the sun. So this is five kilowatt and five kilowatt, and other 10 kilowatt, 10 kilowatt there. So all campus is fully covered by solar photovoltaic panel and a solar water heater. Everything is maintained by local people here. This is solar parabolic cooker here. This is sufficient for 50 people's cooking. And this is made by rural, illiterate, semi-literate women. Like this morning time, we set up with sun, like sunflower. Everything is automatic because here is a pendulum. Tick, 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 tick. So bicycle wheel and bicycle chain. So they are using local material, which are available everywhere. And this is high technical job, but demystify technology. The most powerful point of the barefoot model is that it is simple and people can accept it and people understand it. No theory, only practice on the ground. I come from the Ivory Coast. We're here for six months. After six months, we'll leave. We're making solar panels. We're becoming engineers here because in the Comoros Islands, there are a lot of problems with the electricity supply. There are four of us from Mexico, and we're really happy to be here. We don't have electricity at home. There isn't any in our village. We're going to have electric light, and it'll be free, free. What is common among them is that they are illiterate. What is common among them is that the community has selected them and ratified that they go. And that is the way forward. It's a college only for the poor. We're trying to show that any woman who has never been to school and college can be taken out from their traditional society environment and brought to India and through sign language, train them to be solar engineers in six months. This manual is a new manual only for learn by picture. Everything is by photo learning. One lamp, 98 photos. Open the book and component is mount. Go back home after no problem, installation, maintenance, everything is in, in memory. We'd never have thought it possible to make a thing like that. A lot of people are going to be interested in this. With what we've learned here, we'll find materials and we'll be able to train others to create simple, cheap energy. What's more, it's clean, unpolluting energy. It's good energy. Our planet's already too polluted. 
They can't take all this fuel pollution, so we have to look after it. The barefoot model is a model that has shown that it is possible to live decently within your means. It is possible not to abuse the natural resources that are available and demonstrate that you can live simply so that others can simply live. Espero que la próxima vez vaya él a mi comunidad también. She hopes next time you can go to her community. A mi pueblo misquito. Only after the village is solar electrified, I will go. Tell her. I will promise. Tell her, thank you. We worked in 64 countries around the world. And what the Barefoot College is doing is to show that it's possible to mix the traditional with the modern. And I think that is the solution in the future. Take the community into confidence, let them take their own decisions, let them uh, monitor, administer, supervise. And this is what the Barefoot College has done over the last 15 years. It is possible to replicate the model anywhere, everywhere. And this is happening. The 300 grandmothers who are solar engineers in Africa are the only solar engineers of the whole continent of Africa. Because all the men have left, they've either gone abroad, and they don't go back to the village. So who's left? These women solar engineers. We are told by communities who are poor, coming from poor countries, we don't want the kind of economic growth you have, your productivism. We don't want it. Why? Because we know that it will destroy our whole ecosystem. They tell us things about ourselves, too, and our relationship to the world. All the resource extraction we've done of their resources, of our resources, and the fact that it's the so-called highly civilized countries that are putting our planet in jeopardy today. We live according to a logic of absurd consumption, extraction and oil exploitation, which is plunging the entire planet into crisis. We have to change this model, and we have given this change of model a name in Quechua, because it has revived one of the central themes of this Amerindian world, the relationship with the environment, which in Quechua is suma causa. In English, this could be translated by living well, but in reality, it means a lot more than living well. It means living in plenitude, and there is a strong aesthetic connotation, because sumac means living in beauty. These people are saving our countries and our utopias. The indigenous movement, the unions, the farmers, and all those who wanted change in the country have not only contributed to the resistance, but also to constructing proposals. And all this collective work has made it possible to introduce revolutionary principles into the Constitution. Living well, or summa causae, collective rights, the rights of nature, and the right to water, for example, as a fundamental human right. Here we practice an agroforestry system. We grow a mix of coffee, fruit, and trees. These people have taught me a lot, and I hope one day to be able to pay them back for the knowledge they've given me. For them, living well is the family, friends, local feasts, minga. 
What's Minga? It's work, but work in the community where you share not only a helping hand, but also meals, drinking glasses, jokes, the transmission of knowledge and information. That's Minga. What better way of living well could you ask for? Living well, or suma causai, isn't a proposal that's only coming out of Peru or Bolivia and these Andean or Amazonian territories. It's a proposal that, throughout the planet, is in tune with other visions inspired by the construction of societies that seek harmony rather than the constant accumulation of material goods and constant competition between human beings. Not the I want, always do more society, but the idea of living better with greater respect for nature. We should take up this challenge and leave behind us a world, a livable Pachamama, that's even better for our children and grandchildren. We should think about introducing the recognition of the fact that some things are common and should remain so, including in the law. One might think of grain or water. I believe that this is a whole political project in the largest sense that needs to be opened up, which is the question of the place we should reserve for what should remain unavailable, that is, resisting all forms of appropriation. We need an exit from the way we're doing it and an entrance into a new world. We have to have a new economic vision for the world, compelling. We have to have a new economic game plan for the world, deliverable. We have to get off all carbon-based energies within 35 years everywhere. So that's why I spent a lot of time on this shift to a third industrial revolution, a shift based on reestablishing the commons. This is just good sense. How to resist the particular interests of the few to favor the common good of all and tackle the urgent ecological and social issues that face us. This has been the challenge for nearly 20 years in Notre Dame des Landes in Brittany. Here, an entire population has turned a construction project for a new airport into the symbol of a struggle to protect over 2,000 hectares of land. This in a France where urbanization destroys 60,000 hectares of agricultural land every year. Farming men and women, agricultural collectives here and elsewhere, friends of the struggle here and elsewhere, we resort to occupation as a part of this struggle, to defend this common good that is the earth, because our world is not theirs, and since they sow a desert, they will reap revolt and conflict. Sowing your future development zone is also a way of being far-sighted, of imagining what that zone will be like once their useless and imposed major project has finally been abandoned. Because we're fighting against an airport, but also against the world that goes with it. From now on, we want to establish the communization of land and practices. We take the earth and we will keep it to promote food autonomy as against the artificialization of land. It's also part of progress to fight it and stop it from eating us up. I think that what's happening here is at the same time completely insignificant in history and of major importance because it'll be one more brick in the wall. At this point, we can't be concerned about investing so much to construct an airport in a place like this and at the same time overlook the fact that a lot of people have nothing to eat, no roof over their heads, and are constantly anxious about losing their jobs or not knowing whether when they return from their holidays they'll be told the company's closing and go and find work elsewhere. That's important. That's what we should be investing in. The airport's a false pretext to make people believe that, thanks to this, they'll have work. No, this airport's just another link in the chain. 
Les gens, ils ont peur de manquer. People fear going without a lot of things. And having so much hassle, they can't see their way clear. But once you remove this fear factor, by telling yourself that things will go well, you realize that your life is beautiful because it's going your way. And if you're no longer scared, you've won. This is also a form of protest, which is catching on in Europe, a form that's as interesting as it is positive. It clearly expresses, through its opposition to this pointless major project, the idea that things can be done otherwise, a very clear indictment of the policies that are presently being imposed. Good. Welcome to Paris. Thank you. For 23 hours. In fact, we had a reunion last night. Can you want to take two tickets for the return tomorrow? Two, just in case. If citizens throughout the world mobilize to assert a long-term vision, that will suffice so long as our governments fail to change their approach. Should we choose growth or should we not choose growth? My sense is we probably don't really have that choice. We're moving into a, a post-growth world, whether we really like, want it or not. Does it just mean that we're all going to end up living in a cave eating rotten potatoes? Or could we actually do something better? That transition is about starting with a vision. A group of people, a community comes together and looks forward into this future that's coming and says, what could we create out of that? There's an opportunity there. So my sense is there's something that can happen at that community level. There's an economy that we can create at that community level that's very hard to do from the top, but works beautifully from the bottom up. Thank you very much for your attention this afternoon. You need the regulations here to cut out the worst excesses of casino investment. And you need a nurturing environment at the small scale to build up these initiatives which will create change. And yes, you do need uh, courageous politicians to say some of that. And the new wind of political courage could come from Latin America, where Buen Vivir and the rights of nature have been implemented. Rencontre exceptionnelle, euh, organisée à l'occasion de la sortie du livre de Rafael Correa, de la République bananière à la non-république. While the crisis strikes certain European countries with full force, it's with great concern that we observe them committing the same mistakes as those whose consequences they are now subjected to. We were made to believe that everything was a question of technology by disguising ideologies as science. I believe that mankind's main challenge in this century is to cast off the yoke of capital. Who rules in society, human beings or capital? The top down will have to listen to the pressure from the bottom up. There is no other way. It's Mahatma Gandhi who said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win.